Good morning. Good to see everybody. Let's open up in prayer as we get started. Lord, our good and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we could come in here and be together and worship you. Lord, we thank you that we live in a place of freedom where we are free to gather together in your name. Lord, as not, as not all believers in the world have that privilege. Lord, let us not take it for granted. And we just pray as we meet today, we just thank you that for the music and that we could worship you, Lord. We thank you for those that lead us in worship. And we pray that as we open your word that you would give us understanding, that the Holy Spirit would be here to teach us, Lord, and that we would be open for you to work in our hearts, Lord, to change us as none of us are perfect and we all need to be molded into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. You are the great potter. We are the clay. And just pray that you would mold us and shape us today, as well as each Sunday that we gather together. Lord, we love you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Those of you who are able, let's all stand together.
every breath All that I have Never cease to worship you Shout to the Lord all the earth Let us sing Power and majesty Praise to the King Mountains bow down and the sea We have so much experience with earthquakes. It's almost like they're every day. I'm Rod Sanderson. I'm the pastor here at Rio Dale Baptist Church in Rio Dale, California, among the Redwoods. I've been the pastor here at Rio Dale for about 33 years. My dad was the pastor before me for 22 years, and so someone at the church knew me and still they called me. It was an amazing thing. Well, we're used to earthquakes here and used to some of the damage. Uh, when it gets up into a five, close to a six, uh, foundations start to move. And so I, we kind of knew that was going to be one of the things. Yeah, my name is uh, Dirk Scholes. I'm the interim uh, DOM for the North Coast Baptist Association. I'm also a pastor of a local church in the association. Um, when you have an earthquake, there is a measure of trauma that occurs and people really shut down. You do get jaded. You know, we've had so many that you do just, oh, that was an earthquake. Uh, when uh, Mike Bivens came up uh, from Disaster Relief, we were almost surprised. We knew of Mike. I had known some of the other Disaster Relief leaders in the past. So he was here and he was smiling and he was shaking our hands. He came with Dirk Schultz there. And we were, we were encouraged that uh, he was going to help you if you're Baptist. You were going to help because you're already giving to those things. Um, this church is still dealing with the reality here at Rio Dell. Uh, being hit with the two earthquakes that they had um, with major damage to the facility and they've lost access to about two-thirds of the, the facility as a result. So now they are functioning within the original building that was built in 1952. We, we, we come very dependent upon our facilities to function as churches and I think one of the great gains for this church is that they saw that the building is just a tool and that God can retool them 
to be functional as the church. Um, that the real, the real concern is the body of believers coming together and, and being a salt and light in the community. The help that uh, Mike Bivens helped us with and also the larger, the larger group did encourage us uh, to help not only our church people, uh, but others if they needed it. And we, we tried to make those plans we could uh, to as many as we could. Uh, I've said it, others have said it uh, amongst themselves that we don't know what the Lord's going to do now. It helps to not be anxious over what is next. I, suppose, I think we're supposed to be anxious for what? Nothing? Yeah. And to trust Him and to take our, uh, our prayers to Him. And that's happening. Um, I think we're pretty much at peace. Faithfulness is where it's at. And, and I'm glad we get to, of course, by the strength of the Holy Spirit. He strengthens us that I'm kind of thinking it's merciful for us not to know what may be coming tomorrow. We have a big God who's able to do beyond what we can think or imagine. And it's, it's our limited thinking that oftentimes gets in the way of how God's going to work and do things. Um, and He'll use earthquakes, He'll use fires, He'll use poverty to um, give us opportunity to share the gospel to the least and the neediest that are around us. And now we come to the part of our service where we pray. So I'll open us up in prayer. And if you know of a need, just go ahead and pray that out. Or if God's put something on your heart, uh, feel free to pray it. And then I'll come back and close. So let's pray. Lord, once again, we thank you that we could be here. We thank you that we could pray together and be lifted up when we need it by a whole church full of people here. Lord, I just, uh, I pray for the church in the video, Lord, in, in, in the Redwoods, that they would be able to repair their facility. Lord, just, just pray for the, the California Southern Baptist Convention as they, as they do your work and help churches within our state. Lord, just pray for our members that are out sick and healing and, and not able to be here. Lord, for especially for those that have, some of them that have been out long term, Lord, we just continue to lift up uh, John Papa Nicholas in prayer. Lord, for healing for his leg and for his health to be strengthened and for his son Jimmy who cares for him. Lord, just pray for the Loft family. And for John with Parkinson's, Lord, just pray that they would be strengthened and encouraged. And I want to lift up Susan Clark to you that as she's starting to walk again with, after the surgery on her foot, Lord, just pray for complete healing, that she would be walking well, and just pray for uh, strength for Bob as it's a lot more demands on him with her not able to walk these last few weeks. Lord Jen and everybody else that's out sick and wants to be here with us. Lord, just pray for all that's going on with the world, Lord, these war in Israel and Gaza and Ukraine and Russia that don't seem to be coming to an end. Lord, just continue to pray for peace in the world and for an end to fighting and the atrocities that happen. Lord, just pray for our church. Pray for fat kids that's starting up this week. Lord, we know every every year we get some new and different kids. Lord, just pray that you bring kids here that are eager to know you and lear learn your word and just pray that you would um, continue to give us enough helpers to keep it going and do a good job. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all that 
that have helped. Pray that you just keep them healthy and give them the strength and the energy to to continue to do your work. And now I'd like to open up the prayer request to the congregation. Lord, we thank you for all of these prayers and all of the prayers that you have answered in our lives and at our church. Lord, just pray that we would know the peace that comes with putting them into your hands. Lord, pray that you would help us not to worry when we give things over to you. Lord, thank you that you're all-powerful, and thank you that you care about all of our needs. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The worship in song, please stand.
We've been going through Luke's gospel, and today we come to a passage of scripture that is usually reserved for Palm Sunday. So we usually hear this one every Palm Sunday, and usually when we go over the story, when it's Palm Sunday, we tend to bring big palm branches in and either put them along the back wall of the cross or in the front here, but here's one interesting fact is when we have, when Luke tells, when the other Gospels tell the story of the parade into Jerusalem and everybody yelling Hosanna, it's only John's Gospel that tells us of the palm branches. John chapter 12, verse 12 says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In, 
in Luke's gospel and elsewhere, it just says that they spread their cloaks on the ground. So if we're not in John's gospels, we're going through Luke, we could have cloak Sunday today. <laughs> but uh, we didn't, we could put jackets along the front and uh, <laughs> around there, as jackets are probably the closest thing we have to a cloak as the only robes that we tend to go around in in our day in our culture is bathrobe. And bathrobe Sunday, that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> and here we have, we have great excitement as Jesus is making his way as we've been in the gospel to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And in the gospels, if you notice, the comings and goings of Jesus and his disciple, most Jewish males, if they were able, would go to the three great festivals in Jerusalem three times a year. So we see Jesus and his disciples in the gospel stories going to Jerusalem, going back to Nazareth of Galilee. It was about a three-day journey on foot back and forth from there. So they'd be doing a bit of backpacking, so to speak. And then they would go to neighboring towns and preach and do ministry and heal people. So that's, that's the majority of the Gospels is them making the rounds and going to Jerusalem and going home and going out to do missions work. They're kind of like some early circuit riding preachers. And if you know what that is, that's in the Old West and in the cowboy days, the preacher that would take care of a lot of churches that were out in the frontier, not in cities as most of them couldn't have a full-time or dedicated pastors. So these pastors might show up once every few weeks or even once a month to preach at all these small churches that are spread throughout the frontier. And here we have we have great excitement as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. We see in the Gospels things are gradually revealed. At first, he doesn't tell people who he is, and then they start realizing he might be the Messiah. And then, as we go further and further, now he's freely admitting he is the Messiah, and he's given the well, we have seven recorded I am statements in John where he says, I am the Son of God, using the divine name of God, which Jews consider that to be so holy that we don't pronounce that. We don't say Yahweh. Yet, he was saying it. He was saying, I am the Son of God. And almost every time he said that, outside of the circle of disciples, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, they were wanting to stone him and put him to death for that, for blasphemy. But more and more, the movement of Jesus and the followers of Jesus, the crowd's growing and getting bigger and larger as he goes. And the establishment is feeling threatened by his movement. The, the Sanhedrin is getting together and saying, all the people are following this guy. What are we going to do about him? What are We need to put a stop to this. And the people are seeing it, though. They're seeing he's the Messiah. They're believing in him. They're believing he's the divine Son of God. It's finally, it's all finally public here. And Jesus here makes his final trip into Jerusalem. And he knows what's to come. He knows they're going to crucify him and put him to death. And after Jesus, verse 28, Luke chapter 19, verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it 
and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner asked, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest. So as we continue on in this passage, it has big theological significance. The Messiah, the coming King, Scripture, many of the Old Testament prophecies are being fulfilled. In Zechariah, we see, Behold, your king comes riding on a colt. So here, this Old Testament prophecy is being fulfilled. Jesus is recognized as king. And like a conquering king coming into a city with a great parade and a great procession, he's recognized. Yet, one part of the story that often gets overlooked and what nobody ever seems to talk about is what we're going to focus on today because today is not Palm Sunday. And sometimes when you're teaching a scripture passage, you don't always want to go into all of the little details and side topics as one of my professors in preaching said, don't scare up more rabbits than you can shoot. As there are a lot of tangents that you could go on in a passage of scripture, a lot of details that might distract from the main point. And they're all over scripture and sometimes it's fun to go down those rabbit trails. And so today let's look at Let's look at a secondary issue. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. I mean, this is the fulfillment of all kinds of messianic prophecies going on right here. And the point of it is pointing to Jesus as king. And the main point of the story, we can say, is Jesus, there's two camps here. The ones who recognize Jesus as kings and the ones that want to get rid of him and put him to death. And in the main point of the story, we could ask, is Jesus your king? Do you recognize Jesus as king? Or do you want to live your life in opposition to him? And yet, one of the side issues today I want to go down, verse 30, and on where Jesus calls his disciples to him, he says, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. This is interesting in many ways. Imagine the colts, horses, for much of human history, that's the way people get around. And now having a horse or having a donkey. It's become more of a hobby than a means of transportation for most of us unless you're living way, way out in the back country. It still is for some. My uncle had done some missions work in Nicaragua and he had said that he went, he went out to some villages that were a three-day ride by horseback to get to them and three days back. So it's still, those, those places still exist, but not, not how we normally get around. Now, looking at this, how would it sit with you 
if I told you to walk over to Lincoln Boulevard and there's a Ford Explorer there with the keys in it and I want you to go get it for me and if anybody asks what you're doing just tell them the pastor needs it <laughs> yeah I mean, there's, there's the absurd the absurd part of that saying like you're you're asked you're being asked to go get a vehicle that doesn't belong to you and it doesn't belong to me and if anybody if anybody asks it's just hey we need it for the Lord's work so they'll be okay with that right no I mean then then there were penalties for stealing an animal Levitical law had penalties for stealing an animal. I mean, it's that's rather a serious crime if you steal somebody's animal. Think about the Old West, horse thieves. I've watched enough Bonanza and Clint Eastwood and John Wayne movies to know what they do to a horse thief. Hang them high. <laughs> It was serious business. I mean, in the Old West, if somebody steals your horse, it could be a death sentence if you're, if you're way out in the desert. I mean, people, there are some areas, you know, if you wanted to survive a journey and have enough water and food, you need a horse. I mean, the only... In the Old Western shows, the only person that walked everywhere was Kwai Cheng Kane, if you enjoy Kung Fu. The, the Old Western show Kung Fu. But Jesus tells them that go to the village ahead of you. They're on their way there. Jesus had not been there yet at that time, yet he knows there's going to be a cult tied up there. Well, that's divine foreknowledge. Unless it was just, unless he'd been there before and it was just tied up there all the time, which, well, you couldn't count on that if you needed it. So he says there's a cult tied there which no one has ever ridden. Well, either nobody had ever ridden it because it was the Lord had it, God had it reserved for Jesus, or it wasn't broken in yet. So, Jesus sends them, says, go get it, untie it, and bring it here. You might imagine that the disciples were, might have had some reluctance to go do that, but they had learned by now not to question Jesus. They still did some of the time, but as they went along, they seemed to get better and better at it and trust him more. As they had seen him heal people, have power over nature, calm the storm, rebuke the wind and the sea, raise the dead. And so here, He says, if anybody asks you, tell them the Lord needs it. So they go along with this. And it says, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? How do you think they asked it? Can I help you? What do you do if you see somebody breaking into your car or getting in it? What do you say? And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, because the Lord needs it. And that was good enough for them. Now a few things, a few things we don't 
we don't normally talk about from this passage. Why was the cult there in the first place? Well, it had an owner, as we see in the story. The owner didn't write it, so why was it tied there? Well, he didn't, he obviously didn't write it there as it's never been written, but yet something prompted him to bring the cult there and leave it tied up. Usually you keep your cult, your horse, your donkey in a pen if it's not being ridden. The, the, the other option, I mean, if we're talking in human terms, maybe he could have led it along to carry something for him, using it as a pack animal. Or maybe the Holy Spirit prompted him to bring it that day. Which seems likely the Holy Spirit prompted him to go there and put it there. We don't have a name of this man or woman, it doesn't say. We don't have a name of this person. We don't know why they put it there other than the Holy Spirit prompted him to do that. And what do you suppose that looked like? Was it a loud, audible voice? Was it, hey, this is the Lord speaking. Take your colt. Tie it to the post over there. Maybe. But usually it's what we call the still small voice. An inner voice. Something prompted him to do it. And the way the Lord works, he probably didn't even know why he was putting it there that day. I mean, to go into your pen to put a bridle on it, to lead it somewhere, to tie it up. I mean, that's not something you normally just do for no reason because it's it takes a bit of work and a bit of planning to be able to do it. And then to leave it there, and then to see some men come and start untying it, and to tell you the Lord needs it, if you see somebody stealing your car, if we're trying to put it in terms we understand, you say, hey, what are you doing? That's my car. And they say, the Lord needs it, or I need this for the Lord's work. Might be hard to accept. It's not what you expect a animal thief or a car thief to say. I mean, the problem we have with somebody borrowing our car without asking is cars are worth a lot of money. Just as now as it is then, animals are worth a lot. So this would be worth a lot. They didn't they didn't know for sure as they'd be if they'd be bringing it back. We don't know what they said. Perhaps they knew who Jesus was. Perhaps they told them Jesus needed to borrow it. Maybe they recognized them. Maybe they didn't, but they reply, the Lord needs it and bring it to Jesus. And that's good enough for them. Why? Probably because the Holy Spirit was at work in their lives, speaking to them, giving them the impression that it was okay because it's the Lord's work. Now, that would have to be a pretty strong impression for you or for me if somebody was getting in our car and said we need it for the Lord's work or the Lord needs it and we're going to just be okay with that. Why? Because, well, I think we all have a healthy skepticism, as we should, of when people say that God, God told me something or God told me to do something. People say that. It's more common in different Christian traditions. For instance, we have we have different traditions which guide 
how we do things and how we approach the faith. We have Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Anglicans, which are mostly the Episcopal Church in America that puts a big emphasis on following tradition and church law. Us, Baptist tradition, sola scriptura from the Reformation, scripture alone guides what we do, even though we are still informed by tradition. And then we have Pentecostals, which sometimes rely more on personal experience. And thus, we rightly have some skepticism, and it's, it's a good thing to question it when somebody says, God told me this, God told me to do that. Does it line up with scripture? No, of course, we'll have no problem if somebody says to us, God told me to tell you that he loves you. Sure. That's, that's right in line with scripture. But once it becomes more personal and obscure, we're, we're right to test that to see does that line up to scripture. Yet, somehow here the Holy Spirit had them put this cult out. The Holy Spirit confirmed them then that it's okay for them to take it, that it's legitimate. And how do we know? How do we know these, these types of things when it happens to us? Well, we're going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit here a little bit more, but let's get let's get the rest of the story here. So they throw their cloaks down. The crowds gather. They proclaim, "Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest." The people here, the crowds that are gathered around, they think Jesus is the Messiah that's going to come in, go into the city of Jerusalem, be crowned king in the tradition of King David, and to overthrow the Romans, to, read the revol to lead the revolution that had been going on around them, as there had been and continue to be a lot of violent uprisings against the Romans several revolts. Ultimately, and we'll get to that at the end, there's a final big revolt in AD 70 where the Romans crush the rebellions and tear the temple down to punish the people. Yet, different kind of king is coming in than they realize Jesus being a king of the blind, a king of the lame, king of those who are possessed, king of fishermen, king of outcasts. Yet, as they're proclaiming him king coming in the name of the Lord, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Jesus is saying, hey, now, now it's out in the open. He's been owning it now for a little while, saying, I am the divine Son of God. I am the coming Messiah. I am the promised one. The Pharisees don't like it. This is this. The I am statements he gives, along with the cleansing of the temple that's coming up, are the final straws with the rift between the religious leadership, the Jewish leadership there, and Jesus, where they are deciding we need to finally do something about him. He says, if I, if I keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known this day, what would bring you peace? But now it's hidden from your eyes. It's hidden from them at this time. Why? Because what they couldn't see, what Jesus knew, is he needed to be crucified. 
He put to death in order that are to be sacrificed once and for all so that the sins of mankind could be forgiven. God has a plan. Since it's hidden from your eyes, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So Jesus is giving them a warning and a prophecy of what was to come with the city being destroyed and the temple being torn down in 70 AD following this final rebellion. Yeah, let's go back, let's circle back up to the beginning right here with the cult. The Holy Spirit's at work here in people's lives. We see, how does this work? One example is Acts chapter 16. I'll read to you. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Persia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word of God in the province of Asia. So as Paul and his companions in the book of Acts are going throughout the Mediterranean world, it's curious here that it says the Holy Spirit kept them from preaching the word in the province of Asia. It wasn't quite the right time yet, and the Lord had somewhere else for them to go. So the Holy Spirit kept them out of there, or so they recognized. And what did that look like? Discerning the Holy Spirit that they were not to go there yet. And when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Binthia. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So the wording changes the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to go into Binthia. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got steady at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Hmm. So this is getting interesting here. The Holy Spirit's directing them where they go. They'd been kept out of Asia. Then they went over to the border trying to get into Binthia. Well, the Spirit kept them out of there as well. And so then they're wondering what to do. And the Lord appears to Paul in a vision and a dream, saying, come to Macedonia because God had some work for them to do there. Now, we have to look at the Trinity in the Bible. The Trinity being a core doctrine, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all being part of the Godhead. Three persons in one. Three distinct persons of the Godhead. It can be a confusing doctrine as you go through the Bible. We're right to point out that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, yet we see the doctrine there. One interesting study is when you ask, who raised Jesus from the dead? First Peter 3.18 says that the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 1.4 and Romans 8.11 clearly says that God will resurrect believers through the Holy Spirit. John 2.19, Jesus says he's going to raise himself from the dead, being the divine Son of God. And John 10.18 says God raised Jesus from the dead. So we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all raising Jesus from the dead. Now, back to this 
Back to this story of the cult being borrowed for the Lord's work and us. How does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? Well, can be, as we looked at a passage in Acts, of directing us from one place to another. We see sometimes in the Bible, the Lord directs us by dreams. And that's a hard one to work with. Because a lot of our dreams are utter nonsense. A lot of our dreams are just our subconscious trying to um, make sense of what's going on in our lives. We all have these dreams that don't make a whole lot of sense. And one thing about our dreams, we all have dreams that are really, really interesting to us. And we might be excited to tell a family member about what we dreamed about, but usually it's only important to you. Usually you're the only one that cares about the majority of what you dreamed about last night. Yet we see the Lord giving people dreams all throughout the Bible. And the first ones we see is Joseph being the great dreamer and the Lord giving him a picture of what was to come through his dreams as God had a big plan for his life in order to save his family, which was the nation of Israel in the future. But sometimes, sometimes we as believers might have a dream that means something, that makes a big impression on us. And when you, all I could say is when you know, you know that the Lord put it there, that the Lord gave you something that you need to make sense of. There's one Christian method for dream interpretation that I found very helpful. It's called TTAQ. You could jot it down if you ever. I'll explain it uh, really briefly. TTAQ stands for the first T, title. It's a writing exercise. Give your dream a title of what you dreamed about. It's, dreams are typically a story of something that happens. So giving your dream a title, like if you were going to turn in a short story or an essay at school, can help you to see its meaning. Second T in TTAQ is theme or themes. What themes did your dream have? What are, what are the themes in it? What are the possible themes? It might be many. Jot down all of them that come to mind. T-T-A-Q. The next one's affect. Affect is your feelings. What were you feeling when, it was, when these things were happening in your dream? What do you feel now when you're recounting it? So A is for affect of were you feeling? You know, were you feeling excited? Were you feeling afraid? Were you scared? Were you feeling love? What, what, what feelings does it evoke? The last one is Q. Questions. What questions did your does your dream raise? You could write down a lot of things. What. What possible meanings? What parts of the dream there were unexplained? And then when you're done with this writing exercise, you could look at it as a whole, saying, Was there, does this have some meaning for me in my life and what I'm going through at this time? Or things you're trying to decide? What, what bearing does it have on this? And is this from the Lord? That's not always easy. Sometimes when you know, you know, but sometimes you really have to pray through that. And discern the work of the Holy Spirit, it's just something that takes practice. You learn scripture and does the, do these experiences do what I think the Lord's telling me? Does this line up with scripture? Or is it contrary to it? 
one of the things where we have to be careful with. There's no shortage of books of people that have died and been resuscitated or come back and tell of a heavenly vision, a vision of heaven or a vision of hell. There's all kinds of YouTube videos about it. Some of them are by Christian people. Some of them are. Some of them have a message where Jesus tells them to come back and tell the story. Some of them, some of them sound like a valid biblical message. And they saw something and they're coming back with something that people will listen to. And some of them seem like utter nonsense. Some of them are completely contrary to the teachings of the Bible. How do you know? Well, it's, it's hard to do. And that's where we're coming back to. Discernment and the work of the Holy Spirit. How did, this, how did these people, it says owners, how did the people of the cult know? Well, the Lord made an impression on them. Sometimes the Holy Spirit speaks to us through others. It's good to be in a small group, a small group Bible study, or have Christian friends, especially when you have major life decisions or Christian family members, somebody that you can bounce ideas off or talk about important decisions as they're coming to. I think many of, them, many of us that have been Christians have had other godly people speak into our lives as the Holy Spirit speaks through others. Now, one that was probably happening in this story are gut feelings. The Holy Spirit speaks and works through feelings. And feelings are something that we have to be really careful with. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful and wicked above all else. Don't always trust your heart. Don't always follow your heart. Yet, sometimes the Lord speaks to us through feelings. And sometimes we need to get in touch with our feelings to be able to recognize the work of God. Paying attention to our feelings and those the Lord gives us is often hard especially for rational people, especially for those of us that trust facts rather than our feelings and try to think rationally. It can be hard, it can be hard for a rational person. If these people had been too rational, they might have said, no, you can't have the cult today. Yet the Lord brought the right people there that he knew were going to listen to him in order for the cult to be borrowed. Now, what about gut feelings? Do you trust your gut? You ever been somewhere and things just felt wrong? The hair stands up on your arms or the back of your neck? You're told you need to get out of here? And if you take a step back and you get too rational, you're saying, well, there's nothing objective here where I should get out of here or go home. I feel danger, I sense danger, but I don't see it yet. Do you listen to that? Sometimes that's the Holy Spirit telling you, get out of here. Or that's the Holy Spirit giving you the impression of you're not to trust this person. Or there's some kind of danger here. Or I need to drive home a different way today. Yeah, to the next to the next person or to the rational mind. It might sound silly, but as believers we need to learn to be tuned into the Holy Spirit to keep in step with the Spirit. Let me uh, read a few verses to you. If you look at Holy Spirit verses, we could be here for a long, long time if I want to read them all. 
But we'll just highlight a few. John 14, 26. Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things to bring you remembrance of all that I have said to you. That the Holy Spirit's going to help you bring Scripture and the words of Jesus to memory. The Holy Spirit's your guide in this life that God gives to you. When you're reading the Bible, pray that the Holy Spirit's going to teach us and give us under right understanding of it. Romans 8.26, Paul writes, Likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we don't know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. John 14, 15 through 17, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's the teachings of Jesus and Scripture. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit in us, living in our hearts, guiding us. Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Acts 13, 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work in which I have called them. So we see the Holy Spirit speaking to people. Back to some practical issues of following the Holy Spirit. What about clo closed doors in your life? Somehow, back to Acts 16 when the Holy Spirit was guiding Paul and his companions, keeping them out of Asia, keeping them out of Binthia, and then calling them into a different a different direction to go into Macedonia, closed doors. Open and closed doors don't always, but often means the Lord's calling you in a different direction. Signs. Sometimes God gives people signs. We see that all throughout Scripture. We don't always need to rely on signs. We have the Word of God, the Bible, that's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, a guide. But we see in the Bible, people ask God for signs. People see signs. It's okay to ask God for signs and keep your eyes out. If you need a sign, how about promptings to do something or not do something? That's what we have here with the borrowed cult in inner prompting that the Lord wants you to do something. The Lord leads you to a place. The Lord perhaps leads you, I mean, practical things. The Lord leads you to go somewhere to run into somebody that you need to see. Sometimes the Holy Spirit puts things in our mouths, gives us the words to say. Sometimes the Lord prompts us to call somebody that hasn't been brought to mind for a while that need our support or that needs some encouragement or that needs a Bible verse or that needs something from the Lord. That's something for you to pray every day too. Lord, use me today. Lord, bring me somewhere I need to go. Lord, put me in touch with somebody that I need to be put in touch with. It's, it's just one of those neat things when you say something to somebody and they say, why did you say that? The Lord, the Lord really needed, needed me to hear that. That's exactly what I've been thinking about all day. And sometimes you don't know why you said it. And you know the Lord put those words, the Lord put those words in your mouth. Now there was a young man, I don't know, one time I said to him, I said, you know, something you need to know 
it's not all about what you could do for the Lord, but our faith's about what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And he said, why did you just say that to me? How did you know what I was thinking? All day I'd been thinking of what what can I do for the Lord? It's all about what I can do for the Lord. I, I really just needed to hear that. That just changed my whole paradigm of the way I've been thinking about everything. How did you know I was thinking that? Did you read my, no, I'm serious. Did you read my mind? So, no, I didn't read your mind. I didn't read your mind. And honestly, I don't know why I just said that. But the Spirit, the Spirit gave me words. Another time, another time it was a hot day at the church where I was working in San Francisco. And I had the urge to go to 7-Eleven and buy a Slurpee. Just had this craving. It was like a block and a half away. So I walked to 7-Eleven, I'm about to buy my Slurpee, and there's a bus stop there and a homeless looking man. There's several people there, but a homeless looking man says to me, do you have any money? Can you spare some change? And I felt prompted to talk to him a little bit more, and I said, uh, oh, tell me what's going, what's going on with you. What, what do you need the money for? And he said, Honestly, I'm shaking really bad and I'm having alcohol withdrawals. And I said, that's, that's a pretty serious medical problem. I don't know if you know, but people in hardcore alcoholism can die from an alcohol withdrawal. And this man needed help. And so I gave him a couple bucks and I said, can I, can I pray with you? You need to you need to get some help. This could kill you. You need to get some help. Is there you know, somebody I could call for you? And can I at least pray for you? And he says, yes, please pray for me. I need prayer. So right there I pull him aside and I'm praying over him. And then when we're done, another guy says, can you pray for me? I need help. And at this bus stop I had a line of people. I had people in line that wanted to be prayed for. And I wish this would happen every day, but it was kind of the more unique experience in my life. That it's neat. I mean, it's neat. It's just amazing when the Holy Spirit, I knew the Holy Spirit put me somewhere that day. And in my mind, it was the great bus stop revival. And I never saw any of those people. I invited them all to church. And none of them ever came. And that's okay, but they all wanted prayer that day as they were dealing with, with hard things. Now, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit gives us discernment. Discernment is listed as a spiritual gift, yet it's something for all believers. Discernment is when somebody says something's from the Lord, is it right or not? Well, we have scripture to line it up with in our knowledge of scripture, but sometimes it's going to come down to the Lord's impression on our hearts, the still small voice. Just as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? Because the Lord needs it. That was discernment on their part to let the cult go. When you let your cult go with people you don't know, or you let somebody borrow your car that you don't know of them, I mean normally our rational minds. If somebody you don't know and you've never seen them before wants to borrow your car, somebody you've never seen before, like, hey, I need to borrow your car. I got, I got something important to do. I mean, you probably shouldn't let them. Let's just be real. You, you probably shouldn't let them unless the Lord really tells you 
that it's going to be okay. These guys, I mean, part of them had to wonder if they were ever going to see their animal again. Discernment. It's an inner knowing. Just an inner knowing sometimes when you know, you know. And you need to trust that. It's, it's a leading that the Lord leads you. Romans 9.1, Apostle Paul says, I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us we have a conscience and we need to listen to it. We have the Word of God to line up our conscience, but the Word of God doesn't always tell us what to do in each and every circumstance, no matter what. But we have our conscience that we need to follow, and we have to always be bringing it to the Lord when we're not sure. Lord, I'm not totally sure what to do here. Would you give me guidance? And Paul is telling us about his experience that his conscience bears him witness through the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can guide our conscience. The Bible also tells us for wicked and godless people that their conscience doesn't always work. Their moral compass is off. But for the believer, when we ask the Lord, he guides our conscience. And then there's quickenings. What's a quickening, you ask? Well, that's when the Lord causes something to jump out at us. If you've been a believer for a while in the Word of God, you ever have a verse just jump out at you? And it tells you what to do? It answers your question? It helps you with the choice? Because a Bible verse jumps out at you? what you're reading that day, it just becomes crystal clear and it sticks in your memory and you know that what you've been wondering has been answered. That's a quickening when it jumps out of the Bible and grabs hold of you. Big decisions. The Holy Spirit could guide us in big decisions and we need to take that to prayer. Regularly when we're talking about the big things in our lives, who to marry, if you're going to quit your job, where to go if you're going to start a new job, solving a big problem, thinking about if you're going to move somewhere else, if you're going to buy a house. I mean, all these, all these big decisions that really change the course of our lives, well, they need to be brought to prayer. And we need to be listening for the Holy Spirit. And remember, remember when the Lord called Samuel when he was a child? We see he was asleep in the temple and he heard his name called Samuel. And he ran to Eli the priest and said, You called? I didn't call. Go back to bed. And he hears it again. Samuel. Wakes him up again. Hey, I... You called? No, I didn't call with him. So then the priest Eli says, discerns what's happening. If you, if you hear it again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And so he does that, and then the Lord gives him the message that he was trying to give him. I think sometimes the Lord speaks to all of us, and we're not listening. Prayer is not just talking to God and asking Him for our wants and needs. We're taught to pray that way, but prayer needs to be listening as well. When you pray, either before or after your requests, and you do the talking, you need to say, Speak, Lord, your servant's listening and sit there in quiet for a few minutes at least, saying, Lord, do you have anything to tell me today? Reality is, for most of us, sometimes we don't get anything. But sometimes we do. And we need to learn to listen. 
for what the Lord has for us. What does that mean? We, a lot of people don't like silence. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I remember there was a seminary class in spirituality where, I don't remember the time frame, but we were told to go spend part of the day in silence and then listening for the Lord. And uh, most people found it really, really hard and uncomfortable. I enjoyed it, but that didn't seem to fit the experience of a lot of other people. They seemed to find it really, really hard to have an extended period of time in silence. Now, that doesn't mean you need to necessarily sit out in the woods every day and biblical meditation or anything or anything like that, but to have some silence drives me a little bit nuts. There are a lot of people I've known that just have their TV on 20 hours a day, you know, the noise, or always have the radio on. I remember my grandparents' house, if the TV wasn't on, the radio was on, and if the radio was off, the TV was on just as background noise all the time. You ever, you ever drive somewhere and just turn it off for a little bit when you're by yourself? Sit in silence? Yeah, you can listen to the Lord when you drive. But when you pray, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. No, it doesn't tell us with the cult exactly how it happened, exactly how the Spirit worked in their life, but it worked. They got the message. They followed the Lord. The Lord had lined it up for them. The Lord had caused this divine appointment hundreds of years before in Zechariah when the prophet said, you know, the messianic prophecy of, you know, behold, your king comes riding on a cult lowly and humble. That had been preordained. That had been a divine appointment. We have divine appointments. Don't miss yours. And I'm glad we could spend a little bit of time on this with it not being Palm Sunday. Because Palm Sunday, we always go through this account in John's Gospel, which is a little bit different. Why? Because it has the palm trees. Because it's Palm Sunday. But today is Cloak Sunday. And maybe you've never maybe you've never been to maybe you've never had Cloak Sunday in church. <laughs> Why? Well yeah, we don't we don't tend to wear cloaks anymore. Bathrobe Sunday. <laughs> it's it's fun, isn't it? But I hope I hope you've learned something about tuning into the Holy Spirit today, as it's something we all need to do, one of those Christian practices that we all need to practice. Let's, let's have our closing song now, as you come up, have the worship team come up. And as we close, if any of you would like to come forward for prayer, to receive Jesus, to get back on track spiritually or for anything else. I just want to invite you to come forward as always to pray with me during our last song. Stand together, please.
I'll highlight a few announcements and then we'll be dismissed. There's a reminder that there are connect cards in the seat back of the chair in front of you that you can fill out to put a prayer request on that or to put your contact information if you'd like to get um, church announcements and our newsletter. Also a reminder that you can still give online by bank bill pay or by mail if you wish. Tomorrow's ladies fitness class at 10 a.m. in the worship center. Come as often as you can. This week, reminder to those who help with Fast Kids that Fast Kids is starting for this school year on Tuesday and Thursdays. We can still use more volunteers for Fast if you're able, if you're able to help. And you can always come check it out if you're not sure if you want to commit to helping or not. Um, particularly, I need an extra helper or two on uh, this month on the 17th and on the 26th. The Tuesday, Tuesday the 17th is the middle school day and the ladies who are most of my helpers are away on the women's retreat. So if you're able to help just one or two times we could use an extra adult there and uh, the 26th several of the ladies are going out of town to Oklahoma and that's typically the bigger day with um, on Thursday with elementary school age kids as it would be helpful to have an extra adult or two there that day if you're available and willing to come um, also with children, children's Sunday school and children's church. Um, Jennifer and Michael typically have been doing it every week, and Jennifer's going to be out, out of town on the 29th and on the 6th, so 29th of this month and the 6th of next month on Sunday. So if anybody's willing to step in and be with Michael Brown to do that, that'd be very helpful. You could let let me know about these things or the back table. Um, and as always, you can check for signups on the back table, watch the announcement scroll bulletin and website events page for more upcoming events. Now, as we come to the end of our time of corporate worship, let me invite everybody to stand for our benediction and we'll be dismissed. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.